You don't go to Notre Dame University to learn something. You go to Notre Dame to be somebody. So said the coach of the Fighting Irish, Lou Holtz. Hello and a warm welcome to all the viewers of Wizards of the Street. I'm your host, Ramesh Tamani. So how did Notre Dame, his alma mater, and his years at Fidelity shape him? And today, where does he spot opportunity? My guest manages over a $7 billion corpus at Fidelity International Discovery Fund. He also co-manages the Fidelity Sustainable Equity Fund. Let's hear directly from him. Please help me welcome from Fidelity Investments, Portfolio Manager, Bill Kennedy. Bill, welcome to Wizards. Hi, thank you very much, Ramesh. Very nice to see you. Bill, it's a great honor to have you. Yeah. Uh, let me start with the earlier years. You had a degree yeah. in economics. Yep. Given the course that your career took in the yeah. world of investments, Absolutely. if you had a do-over, what major would you pick? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I've had such a great run investing. The world of investing has you know, treated me very, very well. I was an economics major, as you mentioned before. Um, I studied economics, uh, and the one thing you learn when you study economics that it's hard to predict the direction of the economy. It's hard to predict, you know, the direction of interest rates. And you know, given what's happening all around the world, it's hard to predict the direction of inflation. The one thing I did learn at Notre Dame and in a lot of other places was, you know, the fact that uh, you know businesses are that are run well by good entrepreneurs that have their shareholders in mind and have society in mind tend to do well over a long period of time. Um, it, what would I change? Um, I would probably change nothing. The good thing I loved about the program I was in, it was really flexible. I could study economics, and I learned in economics that it is very difficult to predict the outcomes of the economy. So I decided to take on a lot of business classes. So I took finance, accounting, um, marketing, management, investments, but also that it was flexible enough where I could take you know, philosophy class, uh, theology class, you know, a class on Asian history, and that allowed me to kind of fine tune a different part of investment. You know, business classes will teach you what's good, you know, how to read a balance sheet, how to understand a P&L, and how to understand how businesses function day to day. And that's the science of investing. But to me, what really helps me ultimately, and I think you'd agree with me and a lot of the people that have sat in this chair would, it's the art of investing that's really important. Reading the management teams, reading the market, reading, you know, there's a lot of nuance in investing. Psychology, too. Psychology, exactly. And I'll tell you, my, my, one, of my, my, one of my kids is a psychology major, and I, you know, reading human behavior is really important in the world of investing. And, you know, that helped me a lot and helped me kind of fine-tune that art of investing that I think is really important. And I think people underestimate how valuable that is. Yeah, well, Buffett taught us that, that the yeah. market swims between fear and greed and if you can conquer that emotion, you're probably ahead of this game. Exactly. Anyway, yep. but you talked about taking a class in Asian history. Yeah. So my question is, how does a student in Indiana, Notre Dame, get interested <laughs> in India and emerging markets? Well, you know, it was fascinating because back then, this is, think of the late 80s. Japan was just clobbering everybody. They were producing better cars. They were producing better consumer electronics. They were consuming, they were producing things cheaper and better than pretty much anywhere in the world. Everybody in the United States was worrying about losing market share. They were worried about losing, you know, competitiveness to Japan. Um, I just read a book about semiconductors. The semiconductor industry was going through a big uh, change in the United States because companies like Sony were just producing much better goods um, than, you know, th their peers in the United States. And so I took a class in Asian history just to figure out how did this happen? And the thing that really piqued my interest was Japan was doing very, very well, but there were other countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, that were starting to really... The smaller tigers. Yeah, the smaller Asian tigers that were really kind of bubbling to the surface. And I said, that's where the next opportunity is going to be. You figured that out sitting in Notre Dame class? Yes, I did, because you could see the economic growth, and you could see that they were making a lot of the reforms, and they were learning from the Japanese to see some of the mistakes that were made in Japan, but they had that base of the you know, the, the Chinese family companies that were really incredibly entrepreneurial and could grow their businesses and were, you know, incredible, you know, capitalists by their inherent nature. And they, you know, so you could see that these, these countries were about to just burst in at the seams in terms of economic growth. So that really excited me. So I wound up taking a job in private equity in America with the Prudential, 
And I was there for a year, and just by happenstance, an opportunity came up to work for them in Asia. And that was a, a dream come true. So I picked up, you know, I was 22 years old, picked up my bags, and moved to Hong Kong. Are you seeing India now becoming the China plus one plus two strategy? Well, I think China has gotten more expensive. And if you ask companies in general, they, they're, they're more biased to moving to Vietnam or to Mexico. However, you're starting to see companies, as you know, like Foxconn is producing, Apple. You know, app, producing Apple products here in India. And my understanding is the goal is to, you know, by 2025, to have a material amount of the iPhones manufactured here. So India is benefiting from that, definitely. Um, but my sense is, is that, um, you know, that will be a process that will certainly develop over the next couple of years. The only thing that really needs, in, needs to happen in India is just favor, favorable government policy to make that, to accelerate that process. Which they are doing perhaps yeah. through PLI and through right. budget reform. But you're a student of history and you're a student of economics. Yeah. Does that suggest to you at some point Asia becomes uncompetitive and you move to, say, Africa? Well, the one thing in Asia that has really impressed me is the ability to have productivity gains. What, what, eventually, what ultimately grows an economy? Population growth, which most of Asia, bar China, has, and then productivity gains. And if you look at the productivity gains that have been you know, accomplished, particularly here in India, in Vietnam, um, Taiwan, Korea, I mean, it's been pretty impressive. And a lot of countries in Asia continue to go up the value-added curve and they have high savings pools and very high education rates. And that's what makes, you know, that's a beautiful combination for productivity. When you met, uh, for over dinner, you made an interesting point that you felt that Indian companies deserved a better multiple yeah. than Chinese companies. Why yeah. is that? Well, when you think about it, what goes into a PE multiple? I look at it and say, it's the growth rate that they, that they can do over the midterm. It's the cost of equity, the cost, cost of equity that they're facing, and their ROE, OK? I would argue that given the structural growth in India, the demographic dynamics here. Which are so much more positive. So much more positive than China. I mean, China's you know, population has peaked. India's population continues to grow. Um, so the growth rates structurally are better here in India. You have um, cost of equity is higher here in India. Clearly, interest rates are higher in India. I would argue that that will come down over time, but they're still higher. But the ROEs in India, if you take an Indian company versus a Chinese company, and that's what impressed me when I first came to India, is how high the ROEs are relative to their emerging market and their developed market peers. And I do believe it's really a function of the fact that management teams, because they're mostly owned by promoters, tend to sweat the assets because they're watching, they're turning the lights off because at the end of the day. Because capital is important. Exactly, and capital has a cost because they don't want to be diluted. <laughs> And interest rates are higher here, so the cost of capital is higher. Therefore, assets are very valuable, and they're going to sweat them and to try to improve the returns they can when earn on them. interest rates are zero, everything is, looks interesting. But exactly. That's not true at a high interest Exactly. Rate and level. that's exactly what happened in Japan, and unfortunately, it's happening in China as we speak. It's a curse. The low interest yeah. rate became a curse. Uh, you came to India for the first time. Yeah. You've been coming frequently, I know that. Yeah. But the first time in which year? 1994. 1994, yeah. just after the big bubble of 92 had burst and yeah. foreign investors were allowed into India. Exactly, yeah. Right. And which is the first company that you met? Well, on the first day, I, yeah, the first company I met in India, first day, was HDFC. That's remarkable, isn't yeah, it? It's like it meeting Warren Buffett on your first day in uh, it know, really Omaha. Is. It really is. And, you know, it's just it, because I had, uh, two nights ago, I had dinner with Keki Mystery and, you know, we were talking about it. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing when you can look at a company and, you know, by public disclosures, is still in my top holdings, um, and a company that has been able to withstand the test of time. You know, the management team at the time laid out a path where how they could grow 15 to 20 percent over a 20-year period of time. Now, if somebody, a company were to tell you that in today, in the 90s, yeah, in the 90s, if a company were to tell you that today, you'd be pretty skeptical, wouldn't you? Of course. You know, but just given you know the demographic dynamics and given all of that, um, given you know the low penetration of mortgages, given the um, quality of the management team, the competitive environment. In 94, the case was, you know, that that could happen. The execution is clearly what, you know, myself as an analyst piece. at the yeah. time, as a young analyst, would have to monitor. Um, and, you know, clearly in looking in, you know, what they've done over that period of time, they've, you know, clearly executed. But, but you believe that in 94 that they would grow at yeah, 20%? Yeah, 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 of course. It yeah. was that obvious to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, 
a holding in it, as of the latest disclosed holdings in the funds. It's you know it, it's still been in, in the top ten, I think. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you come from a culture fidelity, which yeah. is known for stock picking. Yeah. Great oh, star yeah. managers yeah. out there. Talk to me a little about that. Gerald Sai, Peter Lynch, all those yeah. are great names in Wall Street. Yep. What did you learn from them, and how does that influence you today? I'll, I'll tell you. You know, the great thing about fidelity is not only the individual personalities. You know, Jerry Sai was an aggressive growth investor. Peter Lynch was, you know, the Magellan Fund. Magellan Fund, very famous investor. <coughs> you know, right now we have a, an aggressive growth investor who's, you know, has phenomenal numbers. Will Danoff. Um, Joel Tillinghouse, phenomenal numbers, deep value. The great thing about Fidelity is you get great mentors, but also you get people that, you know, the, the spectrum is so wide. So you can find somebody, you can always find somebody that agrees with you, but what I like about Fidelity is you can find people that disagree with you. Without being disagreeable. Without either. being disagreeable. So what I try to do is I try to go out and hunt out the people that are on the margin, you know, more value oriented, because I tend to be growth oriented. I'm, I'm investing in India, so right. I, and I, I have a big overweight in emerging markets. So I go out and I try to find people that are a little bit more, you know, interested in buying deep, discounted, you know, companies that are inherently, you know, trading at single digit PEs or, you know, the market just really doesn't like. And I try to under say, hey, listen, I've got this company in India, it's expensive, but, you know, this, this is kind of, this is my investment case, what do you think? And I want them to pick it apart to keep me honest. Have you ever introduced Peter Lynch to any stocks in India? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, um, uh, Keki Mystery did come in and talk to um, our senior senior management team at one point in time. And uh, you know, it, you know, Peter. I don't want to speak for Peter and his views on the company, but uh, you know, clearly the parallels between HDFC and Fannie Mae, you know, certainly rung a bell. And, and Peter Lynch was always a big fan of and all of his books of Fannie Mae. Well, the parallel between American television and Indian television is that we both need commercial breaks. We'll take a break, come back and chat some more with Bill Kennedy of Fidelity. Life, it is said, is the art of drawing without an eraser. Squiggles, stocks, serendipity, and more with Fidelity's Bill Kennedy. Bill, welcome back to the show. Thank you. A book that's widely famous in India yeah. is Peter Lynch's One Up on Wall yeah. Street. And he said, never invest in a stock that you can't explain to a kid with a crayon. Exactly. What is your investment philosophy? How would you explain yeah. your investment philosophy to your four children? I, I, it's, it's almost just, it's very simple like that. It's, I look for companies with big addressable markets in front of them. You know, where I can understand a market, how it's going to develop over the next three, five, and hopefully seven, ten years. And just to interrupt, do you take that cue from how, say, the mortgage market developed in America yeah, 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 or how yeah. the automobile market developed in yeah. Japan? Yeah. But so you have a reference point. You have reference points, but you have to adopt it because each country is different and each point in time is different. So you can't necessarily say, well, it happened in America in the 80s, so it's going to happen in India today. You just it, because that's too simplistic. It's, that's too simplistic. But you can try to draw parallels, and you can try to analyze it with a you know given, you know visiting companies and all of that to try to put it in a cultural and a you know current context. But I look for big total addressable markets, and then you know the second thing I look for is a good management team that can take advantage of that. You know, clearly, I travel a lot. About half of my time is spent on the road. This was pre-COVID, and now we're back, you know, out of COVID, and i am just been on the road now. I've been on the road most of the year, and I still have travel plans through basically the middle of March. Mis visiting management teams are really important to me, and understanding, can is this the right team on the field to take advantage of that um, how do you total gauge addressable that? I mean, Everyone says management, but how, do you, how does Bill Kennedy gauge management You teams? spend a lot of time with them. Um, and you get to know them over a long period of time. If you look at my top 10 holdings, I have had those top 10 holdings for a long period of time, and I've known the management teams for, you know, chances are I've owned the management teams for over 20 years. So you look at what they promise versus what they've yeah. delivered. Is that yeah. your test? To promise and what they deliver, and, and very critical in terms of how they allocate capital. Um, there's a book called um, The Outsiders by um, Thorndike, who um, wrote a book, and he says the best way to measure CEOs is based on their capital allocation decisions. They have COOs running, um, running the operations. They have CFOs to keep, to keep track of, uh, you know, uh, to keep track of how the books are coming together. They have chief marketing officers to sell the products. The CEO, CEOs are responsible for the capital allocation decisions. And the capital allocation decision is 
that's where the buck stops as far as the CEO is concerned. So I look a lot at that and measure them according to that. And you measure them by the return they generate. Return on capital return employed. Return on capital yeah. employed. That's exactly. The and lack of dilutive acquisitions. Right. Yeah. Uh, which is, of course, the bane sometimes of uh, yeah. the top of a bull market. Exactly. You yeah. Know, so uh, there are a lot of ratios that people use. Yeah. You know, P ratio, return on equity, yeah. market cap, yep. cash yep. flow. Yeah. Uh, what would be your most important? Is it return on capital only? It's return on capital or free cash flow yield. Um, so investment process, look at total addressable market management. Next thing is valuations. I do a lot of work on valuations. And my you know, kind of go-to metric at the first glance is free cash flow yield. Because what does that do? It's a nice, neat ratio. Because it allows you to show efficiency, how much cash are they generating. They may be generating net income, but can they convert that into cash? And it's a nice valuation measure because it takes the enterprise value of the company and also the yield, if you will, that you're getting on that enterprise value. So it's nice and neat and kind of boxed up. You know, I will look at PEs. I will look at um, you know, other more traditional valuation measures. And I'll see how they are trading over time. But the flaw in that analysis is that this company may be a bit different right now. And therefore, it may not warrant looking at it relative to where it has traded in the past. Right, and that's the one figure that gives you yeah. the true measure of management's efficiency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other thing is when I look, I look for companies with good balance sheets, and that incorporates, because you're looking at it over the enterprise value, it incorporates the balance sheet as well. Right. So it, it packages it nicely, the free cash flow yield. Correct. A man who doesn't love London doesn't love life. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Samuel Johnson. Is yeah. that still a good place to watch oh, emerging it's great. markets? It's great, yeah. It's because you're right in the middle of it. Um, I have recently moved back to the United States, but I was in London for 15 years. I, I still keep a home there. And, um, you know, as I travel, I, you know, during this period of time, I use it as my base. But it's, it's, it's a great place. When I wake up in the morning, Asia's open. Um, Europe opens very quickly. And then I can, uh, you know, at night, uh, continue to watch the U.S. US and Latvian close. It's great. It, it is. It's really great. And it's a wonderful city to live in. Uh, Bill, as a part of the show, we always do a rapid fire. Are you open to a <laughs> rapid fire yeah. round? Yeah, okay. But yeah, of course. Yeah. Go ahead, say what you're saying. Yeah, no, but some, yeah, but some of the, some of the, uh, you know, one thing of, you know that I've learned and piece of my investment advice that I've always been given is don't predict the direction of markets. That's always a hard one. Understood. <laughs> but we've already made the disclosure that you're a marathon runner, not a yeah. sprinter. You okay. Needs, you needs to prove it. All right. So let's just try that. Okay. Uh, an Indian promoter that yeah. you have admired over the 30 years you're visiting India. Well, I mean, we use the HDFC example, um, you know, so I'll be consistent in my thoughts. Uh, Deepak Barak, you know, has been, you know, kind of the, the guiding light behind the strategy there. So, you know, clearly just, um, you know, very, very admirable individual. Great. You live in London. You travel the world. Yep. Three people you could invite to your house for a drink and dinner. Who would they be, living uh, or dead? It's a gr very eclectic group of people. First one would be uh, Ben Franklin. Really? Yes. He's a lovely, uh, a lovely human Munger's, being. Munger's uh, favorite too, Charlie Munger's. Oh yeah. Oh, it, it, I did not know that, and I didn't choose him because of that, because I honestly didn't know it. He he was a scientist, a tinkerer, an experimenter. He was statesman, philanthropist. Yeah, ph philanthropist, a diplomat. He did a lot of things in a lot of different areas. He had the science part of his brain, the artistic part of his brain, all wrapped up together. You know, he would have made a perfect investor. Ben Franklin, the other two? George Orwell. I mean, you look at his, his writings, 1984. Look at what's happening in technology. How right was he? You know? Um, animal farm. Animal farm. All animals are equal, but other animals are more equal. I mean, <laughs> how right is that in politics and a lot of things in society today? Last one. No, so, so that to me shows foresight, which is important in investing. Investing, of course. And the other one is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, I've spent a lot of time studying the Civil War in the United States. She Suffragette. ran the under, underground, no, underground Railroad in the United States, helping slaves ex escape from the South into the North. She was, a, she was bold. She was dedicated to her cause. She was tough as nails, and she led from the front, which was really important in my mind. That mind. is an eclectic list. A politician in an emerging market who gets it. I I'll tell you, we're not politicians at Fidelity, so I'm looking for the next Lee Kuan Yew. I really am. From Singapore. Yeah, Lee Kuan Yew is, you know, obviously. They don't is, make him like him anymore. They don't make him like him. He was bold and he took a country, you know, that was had a messy divorce from Malaysia and, you know, now look you at know, it. generation changed it. Exactly. A great choice. The best investment advice that you've ever received. I, well, I, um, don't, don't fall yourself to thesis creep. Whenever one point in your investment thesis tends to creak a little bit, 
The others start to fall pretty quickly. I have found that good sellers of stocks when the thesis changes tend to be very good investors. And by that you mean if your investment thesis changes, sell the stock, get out of it? Yes. It just un, you know, the problem we have is when we visit management teams, we, we tend to really like the management teams. We tend to, you know, in general, have very positive biases towards them, positive feelings towards them. But stories do change. And when they change, you have to be very dogmatic in terms of selling. The world is getting richer, the world is getting more connected. So over the next five years, would you buy luxury goods stocks or semiconductor stocks? Well, if you look at the midterm, semiconductor stocks had a terrible year last year. And there's a lots and lots of demand drivers. You know, demand drivers from AI, demand drivers from- you Data know, centers. Exactly, data centers, um, a variety of applications. You know, where I would argue the stocks have gone down because of cyclical concerns, but the structural drivers have gotten better that's usually a good risk reward. So semi semiconductors. Yeah. My wife will be disappointed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I tell you chat GBT, what do you say? That's another driver for semiconductors. It's going to it's going to revolutionize AI, um, and you know you're going to need a lot of semis to do it. You know I tried to go on. You know, I was telling you last night I tried to go on and just enter in a few things, and they said sorry, we're at capacity. Come back later, and that means that they need more capacity. That means more servers, more semis to power yeah. that. Which would be a bigger hotspot in the world, Ukraine or the Taiwanese Straits? That's a, that's a, 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 a pol political thing. I, I'm, I, it's too much of it's too hard to take a view on that. Above your pay scale. What's that? Is above it above my pay your pay scale? scale? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Would you rather get seats to the Super Bowl game that's this weekend or World Cup football? Well, that I'm a New York. Qatar. I'm a diehard New York Giants fan, and so you know, I almost no, but the the idea being that I root for the team. I root for the New York Giants and the team that's playing the Philadelphia Eagles, so I'd like to go and see the, uh, the Chiefs beat the Eagles. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, you travel for a living. Yeah. I mean, you're out of a suitcase uh, most of the year. Uh, which country would you like to visit as a tourist? I, I, whenever I get a chance to go on a holiday, I like to come back to India, because I've seen India in a lot of professional settings. I get, you, know, you stay in a hotel and you visit companies, you go to offices and all of that. And I, I try to travel in much of India um, at my leisure. So right before COVID, we went we went to northern Italy. I took my daughter to northeast India to look at the tree root bridges. Really? Yes, yeah, of course. In which was phenomenal. She, she's a uh, structural engineer, so she did her th senior thesis on that. And that was amazing. Um, and then I've been down to uh, a couple of years before that, we were down in, the, uh, in Kerala, down in the backwater. So, my, my next trip, I want to go up somewhere into Rajasthan and you know, go hiking in the foot. Well, yeah. You answer me to a lot of friends in India, I'm yeah. sure about that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, the Tourism Authority thanks you. Yes. Uh, higher or lower of the next year? Just okay. in your, your gut feeling, the Sensex? Higher. NASDAQ? Higher. Hang Seng? Higher. Gold? Higher. Bitcoin? I'm not going to comment on Bitcoin. I'll comment on crypto. Crypto is very volatile and too difficult to predict above my grade dot, uh, grade, uh, above my pay grade. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Oil? Oil will be higher. And the dollar? The dollar will be lower. Well, you've done a really good rapid fire round. Nothing makes a man so adventurous as an empty pocket. Victor Hugo. Actually, Bill, your adventures and investment acumen have filled a lot of investors' pockets. Thank you for stopping by on Wizards and being a part of our show today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it's it. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Smita, come. Oh, Veso, veso. Scarf?